Welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Jeannie. I'm so glad that you have joined us this morning. If you are joining on Facebook or YouTube later, please just make sure you let us know that you're here. And if you are in need of additional support, feel free to reach out to us. Um, there are some other announcements that, that we have for you this morning as well. Hi, Dick Sparrow. It's your old treasurer, Randy, again, thanking you for your continued support in our uh, missions and ministries here at Dick Sparrow Church. I uh, wanted to remind you to keep sending in those checks, or if you'd like to switch to electronic donation, you can email Kathleen at dicksboroumc at gmail.com, and she'll send you one of those forms, and we can get you set up. Kathleen and I do it. It's simple, it's easy, and we don't ever forget. So... Once again, thank you. It's not too late to join one of our Advent studies. We have studies that are on Tuesday mornings with Reverend Esther at 10 a.m. It is studying the characters of our Christmas story. And we also have a class on Wednesday evenings with Harold Tuckett and Brent Howlett, and that is at 7 p.m. And they are studying the book Incarnation. It is a great book by Adam Hamilton. I highly suggest you read it and join the class for some discussion. All classes are on Zoom. Uh, if you need the Zoom link, please email me and we will get that to you as soon as possible. Our Advent Mission Project is collecting gifts for the newborn king. We are putting together five mother baby baskets for the house by the side of the road. We will be gifting them to the house that then they can give them out to the families who, after they have a new baby. So we need gifts like blankets and hats and clothing and um, we need bath stuff like a bathtub and diapers and wipes. We need toys and bouncy seats and books. Then we could use some uh, gift cards for families to buy formula or baby food. Could also use some bottles and sippy cups. Things can be new or gently used. And all of these gift ideas are on an Amazon wish list, which you can find on our website. And those gifts you can select to, for them to be shipped right to the church. And then we can assemble them and send them to the house by the side of the road come January. Thank you so much for your continued generosity. Let us join together to uh, say our Dixboro vision. Our Dixboro Church is an inclusive faith community living and serving through God's love. And now let us begin worship with the ringing of our church bell. The Advent candle is going to be, the reading is going to be by Brooke and um, Patty this morning. Good morning. Today we relight the candle of peace. It reminds us not to miss out on opportunities to experience the peace of Christ in our hearts and lives. Then we look to 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, where it states, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. John was reminding followers of Jesus to share that love with all that they meet. We are reminded this day that sometimes God's messengers, angels, come to us as strangers. We receive love of God through those strangers as we show hospitality to them and let them into our lives. Let us light the candle of love and hospitality for all. Let us pray. God of peace and love, share your love through us to all around us. Help us to be open to receiving your love through those you send into our lives. Amen. And now let us join in singing with Beth O Come O Come Emmanuel, verse 2.
morning, Mary Turfey is going to be reading scripture for us. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. A shoot will grow up from the stump of Jesse. A branch will sprout from his roots. The Lord's spirit will rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of planning and strength, a spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. He will delight in fearing the Lord. He won't judge by appearances nor decide by hearsay. He will judge the needy with righteousness and decide with equity for those who suffer in the land. He will strike the violent with the rod of his mouth. By the breath of his lips, he will kill the wicked. And now we'll join with joyful noise as we sing together, Lo, how a rose air blooming. everyone. This morning we're thinking about this Jesse's tree. You've heard it sung twice in both of our songs so far. And so I'm going to read you um, a story called One Family. And it's written by George Shannon. And the pictures are by Blanca Gomez. Let's hear about the story. One is one. One lamp one clock, one book to share. One is two, one pair of shoes, one team of horses, one family. One is three, one house of bears, one bowl of pears, one family. One is four, one ring of keys, one pile of pups, one family. One is five, one bunch of bananas, one hand of cards, 
one family. One is six. One line of laundry. One butterfly's legs. One family. One is seven. One bouquet of blooms. One flock of birds. One family. One is eight. One box of crayons. One row of ducks. One family. One is nine. One flight of stairs. One collection of rocks. One family. One is 10. One batch of cookies. One shelf of books. One family. One is one and everyone. One earth, one world, one family. So I thought this book was very fitting for today as we are talking about, so when we think of Jesse's, um, the, the root of Jesse's tree, that means it's Jesus's family tree is basically what we're talking about. And so have you ever seen one of these before? You see this picture of a tree. And then if you look really, really closely, there's a whole bunch of names on it. There's names all over the place. When we think of a family tree, and maybe later you can ask your family about your family tree um, and see how far you can go back. But with Jesus, we're gonna look at his family tree. Now you probably, you have in your white bag that I delivered to you, a pack of uh, little cards. And you can see that this first one starts with Jesus. And I would like for you to today, um, Maybe you could do this during worship as you listen to the sermon. You can set out all these cards and see how far back Jesus's family tree goes. And then along the way, you have to read the names because some of those names might look, uh oh, there they go, falling out on me. Um, some of those names might sound familiar from Bible stories that we've read during Sunday school, or maybe you've heard them during church, but also, don't forget to ask your family about your family tree. Thank you, guys. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for you coming among us. Thank you for helping us see all of your family in light of the Bible. Thank you for our family around us. Thank you that we can be one. Amen. Amen. The next scripture reading is from 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verses 5 and 16. Go to my servant and tell him, your dynasty and your kingdom will be secured forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. God's own. 
through sacrifice, oh, heed the faithful words of Christ. Holy words, long preserved for a walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart, oh, let the ancient world Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, all oh, of the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. words impart Oh, let the ancient words impart This morning as we come to our prayer time, we uh, want to continue to remember those who are on our prayer list. And um, we also want to, uh, there's a new one that has been added, Shelby Wood, which is Barbara Wood's granddaughter. So we want to remember, lift her up. Um, we have a praise today, Jane and Brent Howlett, this is their 40th anniversary today. So we are so happy for you all and many more to come. We also want to remember those who are in, our, in the care centers or at home who are not able to get out. And so we want to uh, pray God's surrounding be upon them. Um, and a friend of mine, I just got noticed this morning, has COVID. And um, so I want to lift her up. Her name is Robin. So if you would just remember her name, God knows who she is. So let us, uh, as we go before the Lord in prayer, let us uh, prepare our hearts. God, we do come this morning. We come during this time of Advent in anticipation and preparation for your birth and for a new birth in each of us. And, and Lord, we, we pray that you would help us to be mindful of all that is happening. Help us to be mindful of, of each other. Help us to be mindful of what is going on in our nation. Help us to be mindful of our friends and our family and help us to also be mindful of caring for ourselves. We lift before you this morning our concerns. Those who are hurting, those who are lonely, those who are depressed, those who are needing a healing touch, those who have lost loved ones, we just place them all before you this morning. We know that you are the ultimate healer and you are the one who gives us hope. And so we pray for that hope today. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who because of him, we have the greatest hope. We know that the end is never the end. And so we join together today in praying the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, the final scripture lesson for today is from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 33. When Elizabeth was six months pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David's house. The virgin was named Mary. When the angel came to her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was confused by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said, do not be afraid. Mary, God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. He will rule over Jacob's house forever, and there will be no end to his kingdom. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So today we continue our sermon series, we, which focuses on us preparing our hearts for Christmas. And I said last week that each week we're going to start with the prophets and then we're going to go to and the coming of Christ and then look at the Gospels and the second coming of Christ. Going to ask, we're, we're going to look at what, what do the scriptures mean for us today. And so we're going to start today with a little boy shepherding his sheep. He was maybe 11 or 12 years old, shepherding the sheep out in the pasture. And while his father and his seven older brothers were meeting with the great prophet Samuel, Samuel had been told by God to go to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem. And he said, I want you to anoint the next king of Israel. Samuel shows up and he at, at Jesse's house and he, he says to him, bring me your sons. So I'm, I'm going to examine them. I'm going to check them all out. And one by one of them, God has chosen. <clears throat> so Jesse brings the oldest and most strapping son. And, and Samuel thinks, surely this is the guy. He must be the one. And, and he looks at him, but in his heart, he's hearing God saying, nope, that's not the one. And, and he said to, to Samuel, do you have another son? And Jesse says, I mean, he says to Jesse, Jesse says, yes, let me bring my next oldest son. And, and he brings the next oldest son. And Samuel thinks, okay, yeah, this must be the son. This is the one. And God says, nope, not that one either. And so one by one through all the seven sons, not a single one was found to be the Messiah, which if you look at the word Messiah, it actually means the one who would be anointed king. And so Samuel is perplexed and he says, do you do you have any more boys? And Jesse says, well, yeah, but, you know, I got a scrawny one out in the fields and he's just a kid. He's watching over the sheep. And so Samuel says, bring him here, bring him in. And, and he, begin, he brings him in and God says, he's the one. 
See, humans decide by outward appearance, but I look at the heart. And this, of course, was David. So David is anointed to become the second king of Israel, God's chosen one. And, and he ended up being courageous and bold and handsome and smart and fierce. He was a fierce warrior. He was a poet. All of these things. But, but the thing most important to God is that he had a heart after God's own heart. David's story is, is certainly, if you read through all of his story, all of his life, it's certainly a story that includes lots of mistakes. And yet God still found him to be a man after God's own heart. He would become the greatest king Israel would ever know. David lived from about 1040 B.C. to 970 B.C. He reigned from 1010 B.C. to 970 B.C. So he reigned for 40 years over Israel. His story ends up shaping the nation from that time forward. <clears throat> he is the second most mentioned person in the Bible besides Jesus. He becomes really a, a really important person in scripture, and his story is told over the course of five books of the Bible. You can find his story in 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 1 Chronicles, and the book of Psalms. We find most of the book of Psalms is, is about David's story and, and several of the prophets who were pointing back towards him. So a, he was definitely a powerful figure within scripture. And the nation of Israel still sees David as the ideal king. When they look at their leaders and their rulers and, and all of these things, uh, all of their leaders, they, they look at David. So, in fact, if you went to Israel, you would see the Star of David is still on their flag. So let's look at scripture. We heard a moment ago from Mary Turfey from 2 Samuel. David has been ruling as king for some period of time. And Nathan, the prophet, comes to him and he says, this is, this is what he says. He says, go to my servant David and tell him, thus says the Lord, your dynasty and your kingdom will be secured forever. Your throne will be established forever. That little statement becomes known as the Davidic covenant, the promise or a covenant that God made with David that a descendant of his would always reign forever over God's people, not just for a time, but forever. This becomes important because, as we heard last week, at a certain point, there is no longer a kingdom in Israel. And, and the nation of Israel um, is reporting to a great king, another, a, a different great king. The nation of Israel is wiped off the face of the earth and the people are taken into exile. And, and then many of them were brought back to live in Assyria. So during this period of time, they remembered that God had promised them what? that their ancestor David was going to rule forever. And if that was the case, then clearly there was going to be someone from, from David's line of rule forever. They had hope. This must mean that there is going to be a kingdom again, that somehow in their darkness, they were going to go back and have a chance to live as a nation, living in the same land where Israel was, and they were going to have a king again. Because God promised this to David. So this is the Davidic covenant. It became very important, far beyond what David ever imagined. The people looked to it from generation to generation, every generation until the present time. And the Jewish people continue to anticipate that a king will come who will reign after Father David, a Messiah will come. They look at everyone, like I said, of their rulers and leaders as that they should be ruling like David and, and the way that David did with a heart after God's own heart. This promise was so important 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, and to the present time. Sometimes the only thing that gives us hope is a promise. Most of the time when, when we're not feeling hope or when we're feeling hopeless, 
all we have is a promise and we trust in that promise and we find hope in that promise. I know um, when I was still in seminary and I was serving at the Methodist Hospital in Des Moines, um, <clears throat> I, I'm sure I've told you I, I have a fear of storms because when I was young, we were caught in a storm and had to run up the hill and go to the basement. But so I, I still have this just kind of um, unnerving feeling when it's storming outside <clears throat> and excuse me. So I still have this unnerving feeling that that it's just it just kind of, I don't know, brings anxiety to me. And that night when I was on call at the hospital, I'd spent the night at the hospital and um, the floods came and it flooded the area. And as I was on my way back to my parents' house, because I was there for the summer doing this extensive study, I couldn't get back. I kept having to be rerouted in the, and I'm like, God, you promised that you would never flood the earth again. So I think it's okay. We hold on to those promises and, and God helps us. Um, we continue to have that faith and we, we trust in that promise and, and we find hope in that promise. And it's okay to remind God of his promises. So we're going to look, we're going to turn to the prophet Isaiah. And we're going to look at what's happening in Isaiah's time. Isaiah prophesied from 740 to 686 BC. And there's a lot that's happening during this period of time. Um, we talked a little bit about it last week. Uh, around 740, Isaiah begins warning the people, if you walk away from God and you, you step away from God's protection, terrible things will happen. Because the Assyrians, they're coming. And the only chance you have to survive is if God is protecting you. And in 722, the Assyrians marched against Israel. Israel ceased to exist as a nation and the people were in exile. So during this time, Isaiah continued to prophesy, warning the people of Judah now, saying, if you don't listen, if you don't learn the lessons of Israel, of of Jerusalem, you're going to find yourself in trouble as well. So they turn to God and they trust in God. This is what he's telling them to do. And they have a king at this time. His name is Hezekiah. He began reigning around 716 BC and he becomes a righteous king. He does what is right. He, in the eyes of the Lord, things seem to be going pretty well for a while. And in 705 BC, the king of Assyria dies. This is important. You're going to find out why. The new king, Sargon II, is trying, you know, he's, he's kind of flexing his muscles and trying to figure out where his strength is. And so he wages war against the people who are now, who live in modern day Turkey today. And, and he, as he does, he actually is defeated in battle. Now, Assyria is the strongest. That is the place where, you know, they've been in charge for a long time. And all of the people in this area have been paying a tax to Assyria to leave them alone. In essence, it was kind of sort of a protection tax. And, and they would honor him as king of kings. He, he was the highest king, and, and they had little kings themselves. So Hezekiah was a king, but he reported to the Assyrian king, and he gave him money every year. But at this point, Hezekiah says, huh, he's not so strong after all. He sees the weakness of Sargon II, and all the kingdoms noticed the weakness of Sargon II. And so they decided they weren't going to pay their taxes anymore. And now's our time to stand up and rebel. And, and so that is exactly what they did. They began to rebel against the Assyrians. Well, what happens is that in 702, Sargon II dies. And the new king of Assyria, Sangakara, I practiced that too. Sangakara is not weak and he leads the troops that begin to march upon Judah. 
Now, they bypass Jerusalem, and they destroy every major city in Judah. And there are 40, 40 major cities, and they destroy them all. And Hezekiah is praying, and he calls on the prophet, and he says, what are we going to do? And Sangakara sends a note to the king. He says, don't trust in your God. He is not going to save you. Look what I've done to these people in all the other cities. So trust in me. You're going to surrender and you're going to surrender the city to me. And I would like $13 million because in today's money, that's what he actually asked for. And Hezekiah said, I'll give it to you. I will give it to you. They stripped the gold off the doors of the temple. They, they took everything that was in the temple, everything that was in the palace, and they gave it all to the king. But the king didn't destroy the city, which was actually the way he usually would have acted. And he would come and destroy the city, and he planned to kill Hezekiah. But the Bible says something happened that night. There was a plague that struck, and all the Assyrian soldiers fled back to Assyria. So he left the walls of Jerusalem stand. And he reported that he actually let Hezekiah stay where he was as a caged bird. But he said, I brought my money and my people back with me. So why do you care about this? I mean, I think it's kind of interesting, but, but why do you care? Because the, the prophecies in Isaiah are about the coming of a Messiah this is their historical context. The cities were destroyed. The people were taken back to Assyria. And it seemed like there was no hope. One tiny little city was left, and that's Jerusalem. What had once been a great kingdom. There was nothing left but little Jerusalem. In the context, and knowing what actually happened, the prophecies actually make more sense. So let's look at what Isaiah has said. A shoot will grow up from the stump of Jesse. A branch will sprout from its roots. What's that talking about? Well, Judah has become like the stump. And, and the king of Assyria had taken an ax to the whole country. He felled the tree that once was Judah, and, and there's nothing left but a stump. And Isaiah is promising, trust in God. Don't give up. Hold on to the promise that God made to David. Who was David's father? Do you remember? Jesse, right? So a tree will shoot up from the stump of Jesse. This is a promise made about David and a promise made by Nathan to David. So there is going to be a future. Just don't give up. Hold on to the promises. What does this mean for us? Every single one of us at some point in our lives, probably multiple points in our lives, feel like we've been cut down. Like what we knew in our world has been just been chopped down. We have certainly all experienced that this year. All of us have moments when we feel like we are the stump and everything has been taken away. Our hope is gone. And this passage tells us that there is always hope. For the children of Israel, there was always hope. There was this promise that God made, and because of the promise, we know there will be a shoot spring up from a stump. So don't give up. We sang the second verse of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We don't normally sing that verse for some reason, um, but it says, O come, thou root of Jesse's tree, an ensign of thy people be. Before the ruler's silent fall, all peoples on thy mercy call. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. So here we have telling the whole story. The root of Jesse's tree was Jesus in the end. And this king who would come and rule forever, Jesse's tree is also a reminder for us that there is always hope in hopeless situations. We remember the promises of God and therefore 
we have hope. Isaiah goes on to describe what this ideal king will look like. I want you to listen to what he says. The Lord's spirit will rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of planning and strength, a spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. He describes the spirit of God who's going to be on a king who will rule. And when Jesus is first Jesus first started his ministry, he went to the wilderness and was baptized by John the Baptist, who we talked about last week. And when he was baptized, what happened? The spirit came upon him in the form of a dove. And the spirit then leads him out into the wilderness to be tempted. And then he operates in the power of the spirit. So when he preaches his very first sermon in his hometown of Nazareth, he reads from the scroll of Isaiah, the one that says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, he says this day, this scripture has been fulfilled. All of this is a way of Jesus and the gospel writer saying, hey, he's the one. He is the shoot that is springing up from Jesse. Isaiah goes on to say this. He will judge the needy with righteousness and decide with equity for those who suffer in the land. He's going to be concerned for the poor. He's going to be concerned that the vulnerable, the hurting, the marginalized will have access to justice and to be treated with equity. And he's going to be concerned for those who suffer in the land. After all, who did Jesus spend most of his time with? It was the poor, the broken, the people who were marginalized, people who were made to feel like they didn't count or matter. That's who Jesus spent his time with. So now we're going to move on to the gospel. And this is where the angel Gabriel comes to speak to Mary in Nazareth. And the angel said, don't be afraid. Why do you say don't be afraid? Because usually people were afraid when an angel appeared. And Mary, he said, God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. And he will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him Notice this, the throne of David, his father. He will rule over Jacob's house. How long? Forever. And there will be no end to his kingdom. Does that sound familiar? It goes back to that promise that Nathan made to David. It goes back to that promise that was made by Isaiah to the people that there will be a king from David's line that will rule forever. Isaiah said there would be a root that will spring up a branch from the root of Jesse's tree. And that idea of a branch becomes a picture of the Messiah too. The town of Nazareth is where Mary grew up. It's where Jesus also was going to grow up. And Nazareth, if you look up the word in Hebrew, actually means branch. So these people had moved to a town or maybe her forebearers created a town, but they called it the branch because they were hoping that maybe one day the Messiah would come from their town. God had to have smiled when that happened because Jesus would grow up in a town called the branch and he himself was the branch, a shoot from Jesse's tree. And that leads us to the return of Christ. We know Jesus came, he lived among the people, he suffered and died and he rose again. But before he left, he said, I'm going to come back again, the second coming of Christ. I'm going to come back and put everything aright. Isaiah 11, 6, 9 reads, the wolf will lie, live with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion will feed together and a little child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze, their young will lie down together and a lion will eat straw like an ox. A nursing child will play over the snake's hole. Toddlers will reach right over the serpent's den. They won't harm or destroy anywhere on my holy mountain. The earth will surely be filled with the knowledge of the Lord, just as the water covers the sea. So what is this talking about? 
It's talking about heaven. It's talking about how God's kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. I love that he describes animals there and, and he describes children and toddlers being there. And he describes the fact that no animals are going to harm the other and, and people won't harm other people. And, and there's not going to be any violence or bloodshed. There'll be no more sorrow or suffering or pain. The old will have passed away and the new will come. And that's what we read in the book of Revelation. These are all pictures of this peaceable kingdom where there's no more suffering afflicted by human beings or upon human beings. This world, thank God, is not all there is. There's this promise that we have that someday, despite the present suffering, that no matter what's happening, Christ will return someday and the world will be made right. I hold on to that promise. When life is difficult and when it's hard, and during the period of the plagues, the people held on to that promise. And during world wars, people held on to that promise. And today during COVID, we hold on to that promise. We might be in the midst of sorrow and suffering terrible tragedy, but this is not it. This is not all there is. Each week we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We believe that someday that, we will, that, that that will actually happen, that, that what is on heaven is on earth and history as we know it will be rewritten. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. The old will have passed away and the new will have come. We hold on to that promise, this promise of heaven, this promise of life, this promise of a different kind of world without sickness or pain or brokenness. Hope is what we need. When life circumstances are hard, that hope for Christ comes. And, and from the promises that we have, I look to the promises of God that, that, that he has made in scripture, how God has acted in the past, and I find hope for the present. As Jeremiah said, despite my pain and brokenness, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. He called to mind the promises of God, what God had done in the past, and, and I think about the promises that God made, and, you know, several come to my mind this, that I have studied throughout as I grew up in church and, and seminary and different things. But today, for sure, there's a shoot from the stump of Jesse. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff. They comfort me. As far as the east is from the west, so far shall I remove your sins from you. I love you with an everlasting love. I know the plans I have for you. This is one of my favorites. Plans to bless you and prosper you. Plans to give you a future of hope. I hold on to the promises that Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. It is also, I don't, it is, I don't be afraid. He said this when people were scared and nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I love the fact that he says all things work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I go to prepare a place for you. I am the resurrection and the life. All of these and thousands others are the promises etched into my brain by hearing and reading the scriptures throughout my lifetime. I trust in these promises and no matter what my present circumstances, I know from the stump, a shoot will spring forward. And I know I belong to God. And somehow it's gonna be okay. We are people of hope. I love how Zachariah says the children of Israel were prisoners of hope because of their faith in God. And that is where we find hope. My invitation for you today is simple. Put your trust in Jesus Christ. When walking through dark times, read the promises. Remember what Jesus said, trust in him. Therefore, you have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never fails. His mercy never comes to an end. It is new 
every morning. He promises to always walk with us. Pray with me. God, you know the moments in our lives that the tree has been felled and we are left with a stump and and there seems to be no hope. Help us to continue to trust in your promises that a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, that you are with us and you never leave us or forsake us, that you have a way of, of taking all things and forcing them to become good in our lives when we trust in you, that your steadfast love endures forever, that it is new every morning. Help us to remember your promises and to fully trust in you, that we will not be afraid and we will find in you our hope, our strength, and our love. We offer our lives to you and we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to join in singing, People Look East. People look east, the time is near of the crowning of the year. Make your house fair as you are able. Trim the hearth and set the table. People look east and sing today. Love, the guest is on the way. Furrows be glad the earth is bare. One more seed is planted there. Give up your strength, the seed to nourish that in course the flower may flourish. People look east and sing today. Lo, the rose is on the way. Stars keep their watch when night is dim. One more light the bowl shall brim. Shining beyond the frosty weather, bright as sun and moon together. People look east and sing today. Love, the star is on the way. Angels announce with shouts of mirth. Christ who brings new life to earth. Set every peak and valley humming with the word, the Lord is coming. People look east and sing today, love the Lord is on the way. Thank you, Beth, that was just beautiful. So know as you go forth this week that we do have hope. And it is through our Messiah. So go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.